people just need to get comfortable <laughs> with these things. Just talk about what you're doing more and more. And the most important thing for developers is just to start testing things as quickly as possible. But it's not like I had this vision throughout my life and about this better form builder. The danger is that you don't have a strong vision and then you're just going to build a really bad product because you just, you're building what everyone wants. Hello and welcome back to Indie Bites, the podcast where I bring you stories of fellow indie hackers in 15 minutes or less. Today, I'm joined by Peter Soom, who is the co-founder of Reform, a tool that lets you easily create simple, brandable forms. Peter is also part of the Tiny Seed First Batch, where he was working on a product called Branch. After Branch didn't quite work out, he went through a period of testing and validating ideas. Using Twitter and a very early stage MVP, he validated the idea for Reform and got to work building. Since then, he's had a number one product of the week on Product Hunt and is now working through the challenges of building features and growing revenue. You might have also heard Peter on the Out of Beta podcast, which he co-hosts with Matt Wensing. Throughout this episode, I speak to Peter about his marketing efforts for reform, but how does he know what's working and what's not? Well, Peter uses Fathom Analytics for a simple bird's eye view of the performance of his website, which is why I'm happy to be partnering up again with Fathom as a sponsor for this episode. Fathom gives you simple website analytics that are easy to understand and respectful of privacy laws. They are also a bootstrap, transparent and sustainable business, so I love supporting them. We are used to getting analytics for free, so it might feel a bit strange paying at first. But once you realize the true cost of free Google software, and most importantly, see how awesome Fathom is to use, you'll never look back. Oh, and you can install the lightweight code in as many websites or projects as you like, getting a 30,000 foot view of the performance of all your sites. Head to usefathom.com slash bytes or hit the link in the show notes to give it a go. There's also an extended 30 minute version of this conversation available on the Indie Bytes membership for just £4 a month. Link in the show notes or bytes.fm slash membership. Peter, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thank you. Great. Let's talk a little bit about Reform and what happened in terms of you coming up with the idea after Branch. So talk me through your process exactly of coming up with that idea after Branch. Yeah, as you mentioned, we were testing a few different ideas. And and to be honest, when I had the idea for the name Reform, I knew in my mind that I had to go for it because I love the name so much. And I knew that it was going to be a challenge because it's a really crowded market. I think there are many ways you can validate a product, but we knew that we quickly needed to figure out if we could get any sort of attention for this product. Like it had to do really well just within my Twitter feed, because if we can't even get traction there, it's going to be really hard to get traction for a product in such a crowded space. So we built a website for it, the old school way of just put up a landing page. But we put a ton of energy into it. We sweated all the details. We spent a lot of time on the copy and the design. And we built a simple prototype, which was just a form. So we wanted to build a form builder. But instead of testing a form builder, we tested just the output of that form builder. So we built a sort of like a hard-coded form instead, just to give people an idea of what we were thinking. And then that prototype of the form also served as the early access sign-up for the product. And one important thing we did was we had three options you could pick from uh, when you signed up for the early access, which was, I'm interested in this, shut up and take my money. And then the (laughs) the last one was just, I I just want to follow the journey. How did that validation go? How many sort of people did you get saying that they they wanted to, you'd shut up and give you their money? Yeah, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was definitely enough that we felt like we had to go forward with it. So the tweet got like 100,000 impressions or something like that, which is a lot for my kind of amount of followers. We got 500 signups. I think we ended up having twelve or 1,300 when we actually opened up the early access. So what made you pursue Reform as one of those ideas that you wanted to get validated? I know you did it quickly, but you did spend a lot of time on building that landing page. Was there anyone that was speaking to you and going, Peter, we, we need a better form experience? Yeah, like in the beginning, I was skeptical because there are so many form builders out there, but I didn't find one that I liked. And when I talked to other people, I got the same vibe that they were frustrated that there wasn't just a form builder that was really easy to put a form together and make it look like your own without having to do a ton of customization. They described it like a Stripe checkout that's Mm -hmm. so native looking that it just almost feels like a part of your operating system. Where are the other form builders messing up so so badly? Because surely it's like quite a simple thing to do. 
Yeah, I think they're just overcomplicated. They have too many options. They're they putting a lot of design decisions on you or they're overly restricted. Like some of them only allow you to put one question at a page because the form needs to be conversational. And on the other end of the spectra, it's like you have a million different templates with stock photos and stuff like that. In what I learned is that when people need a form, they just want to quickly put something together because they thought about it. And they're not looking to have a creative outlet. And I'm actually realizing that a product like Reform, we're almost competing with something like a poll on Twitter. The same frictionless, I, I have a question I want to ask this group of people. Let me get a form <laughs> really quickly. Certainly was very impressed when I, I saw it. I was instantly like, yes, the world does need this, especially when the likes of Typeform just ended up being difficult to use and you've shared this with the world with your product hunt launch you got number one product of the week huge congratulations on that peter because it's not easy to do can you tell me how you went about getting to number one product of the week on product hunt yeah for sure i think the important lesson for me with product hunt is that i followed the playbook the same that kind of Corey haynes has been promoting but i think the important part about a product hunt launch is it shouldn't be your first step when you're testing an idea but for me it was more of a i did some validation first I really worked on the positioning of the product. So I knew that it resonated with people. And then a couple of months later, when there was an actual product, we launched that and that also worked well. So it told me that our positioning was still working and that the activation of the product was working as well. So I felt more and more comfortable that not, it's time to put this on product hunt and see how that goes. So it's just, it's a step in the go to market strategy for the product. If you put your heart and soul into a product hunt launch, it might not work. Peter Levels can launch something on the same day and you're, and you're screwed. But if it works, it's a good sign that if you pour a ton of leads into your funnel, it will work. And then I followed the playbook, which means I had prepared everything in advance. I had someone to hunt it. In my case, it was my friend, Derek. You just need to take it seriously because I see people with thousands and thousands of followers on Twitter, but they'll put it on product hunt 10 hours after, you know, the, the voting has started and they don't really promote it much and they get 27 votes and it doesn't work. You can schedule it in advance. You can have all your assets prepared and upload it for a week. You can record your video, maybe take, do a few takes. So it's good. And what I think is extremely important and something Derek also told me is wait until you have some really happy customers because you're going to need that support. So I had probably a list of 30 people that I, I knew was happy paying customers of Reform that I reached out to in advance. So I was, hey, we're going to product hunt this day. If you have anything nice to say about the product, it would be really appreciated if you, if you would do it that day. And what that means is now, of course, like we made product of the week, which was awesome. But also if you go to our product hunt page, which people will do in the future because it ranks really well in Google, is this repository of 100 people or something like that saying really nice things about our product. And that's something that's really valuable. Yeah, you've, you've explained the playbook really well there. And I'll leave a link to the episode I did with Derek Reimer, where he explains how him and Corey did really well on Product Hunt. It's good to see your success with it, but you've done, taken all the steps, validated the idea, got initial users, initial customers, did your Product Hunt launch, done well. But what's next now for Reform in terms of future growth? How are you thinking about what features you're going to build, what marketing you're going to do to grow it further? Yeah, so I see every step of this kind of like go-to-market strategy as a test as well. And I feel like it's passed the test so far. So I feel really good about starting to find more scalable channels that, we, that are more long-term than Product Hunt. So for us, we're a pretty low-priced product, a highly self-serve. So I think in our space, it's important to somehow figure out SEO to some extent. So that's definitely one thing. The product in and of itself has some viral components because you share your form link, which is interesting as well for us to explore. And so there are a lot of like classical kind of like growth things that we can play around with. But I think I'm not 100% sure that I'm completely done with all these things that don't scale because I think people tend to skip that step too mm -hmm. quickly. What I've seen, especially with the product hunt launch, is just that there is a ton of value in spending a week or two on something even though you're only going to do it one time but then do it really well all of these things are not long-term growth plans but you can get pretty far and maybe even to at like a default alive stage just by 
doing all the one-off things so lots of different smaller things that might not be hugely scalable or long term but that you focus on them do it well i think that's great advice how are you approaching building new features and product development in general for it yeah i think this is an important one because if you do well in product hunt you are going to get a lot of feedback and feature requests and stuff like that and especially with a product like reform because we were literally just testing ideas and the second one we tested strongly resonated with a lot of people so we decided to build it but it's not like i had this vision throughout <laughs> my life and about this better form builder so it's the danger is that you don't have a strong vision and then you're just going to build a really bad product because you just you're building what everyone wants. And I think the way we compete with a, a competitor with 500 employees is not on features. <laughs> the way we can be different is by having a simple product. So the way we prioritize things right now is everything that we think about putting into the product, we think about, will this complicate the product and make it harder to get started with? Or will it make it faster to use the product and a better experience. And you're really active on Twitter, Peter. You're actively talking about how people should do marketing, the experiments you've done with marketing. So many developer founders really struggle with where to start with their marketing. Where should they start with it? Follow great marketers. Corey Haynes puts out a lot of stuff these mm. days. When I started thinking more about marketing, Justin Jackson was putting out a lot of things, marketing for developers, which I think is still a great resource. People just need to get comfortable <laughs> with these things. Just talk about what you're doing more and more. And the most important thing for developers is just to start testing things as quickly as possible and challenge yourself. Do you actually need to build a form builder or can you just build a early access form that looks like the form you want people to be able to build and put it out? Well, I, I've actually found on Twitter, uh, just over the last week, just sharing my process of what I'm doing and what I'm working on has not only helped me with meeting people and building that sort of publishing and sharing muscle, but it's also helped me a lot with growth. I have a really good feeling now about what tweets will do well and what tweets people don't care mm -hmm. about. If your Twitter account is like you complaining about other companies and stuff <laughs> like that, no one wants to follow that. Mm -hmm. And if you're like a solo founder and the way you're going to get customers is you're building in public, like you need to be able to generate buzz and you need to be able to put out something that's interesting. And by tweeting a lot, you actually, you get a ton of feedback and you get to see what does well. So we've had three launches so far with Reform. We launched the website that we announced that we're working on the idea. That was a test mm -hmm. to see if we should continue. And then we launched the product, which got even more traction. The first tweet got 100,000 impressions. The second tweet got 150,000 impressions. And then the third launch was the product hunt launch. So we were learning how to do things and seeing what does well, like when to tweet and who to talk to before and what made a big difference in terms of who retweeted it. And there's so many little tricks, like just tell everyone that can help you possibly, mm -hmm. because then they'll probably help you. But you learn all this by just keep doing it because it's a feedback loop and you get better at it. There's a ton of useful tips in there. I think if anyone follows that advice and gets to sharing stuff regularly they're gonna start to to see success with it or start to see progress and you mentioned getting funding you were part of the first batch of tiny seed funding why was it at that point with branch did you decide that funding was right for you and how does tiny seed differentiate to like a vc fund for instance yeah we actually we have money from tiny seed but also from more traditional vc so i've seen different sides of it for me, when I joined Tiny Seed, it was not so much about the money and much more about the people. I'd probably pay <laughs> to be part of it. I will say after getting the money on your in your bank account, it's nice to have some funding <laughs> and the strings attached to something like Tiny Seed money is not, they don't feel very uh, tight. I think in the indie hacker space, people have very strong opinions yeah, about something yeah. they probably don't maybe have a, a lot of experience with. As long as you haven't raised like a series A and you have a board, you probably still have most of your flexibility. And I decided on the terms. And it's also allowed me to work full time on this business since the summer of 2019, while having a child and having a life at the same time. I end every episode on three recommendations, a book, 
that's inspired you, a podcast and an indie hacker or entrepreneur people should follow? I will say the Traction book by mm -hmm. Gabriel Y. Weinberg and Justin Maris. The OG podcast for me is the Tropical MBA. And then Indie Hacker Entrepreneur. It's kind of bad, but I will have to say Derek Reimer because I'm <laughs> taking so much inspiration from him and he's uh, been a huge support as well on this journey. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much for joining. I'll make sure I put links to everything we discussed in this episode in the show notes. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode with Peter Soom. If you want to hear more from Peter, I'll leave links to his Twitter in the show notes, or you can hear the 30 minute long episode on the Indie Bytes membership at bytes.fm slash membership. And a big thanks to Fathom Analytics, as always, for supporting the show. Love those guys and love the product. See you next week.